So Dana, you, in previous segments, you've talked about um, calling 911 and, and if I find myself in a self-defense situation that I really need to be one of the ones that are, are calling. So I just like to get your take on what I should be saying. You know, I don't feel like I'm going to have anything to hide, but I'm also going to be really nervous. And you know, that could cause a problem with me, you know, saying something I probably shouldn't have. So what do you recommend? Well, as a general rule, one will rarely regret having said too little. On the other hand, if you are a victim, then people will expect you to behave like a victim. Uh, so it's a tough call to know exactly what to say. I think you should call 911. I think you should uh, correctly identify yourself and your location and ask that the police be sent immediately. And uh, I don't disagree with the advice that you can say there's been a shooting or there's been you know, a robbery, all that. Um, I think you probably should not plan to say I shot someone or something like that but if you say there's been a robbery there's been a shooting there's you know send medical send police that kind of thing that's going to get the response begun um, you know uh, there are people in the industry who then it's who then say after that the only thing you want to say is there's the evidence and I want to talk to my lawyer as I say I think you will rarely regret having said too little on the other hand, the people that are coming are there to find out what happened. And they have forms to fill out and reports to file and decisions to make about whether someone should be charged and if so, whom and for what. And if you are not providing some of that narrative, it could begin to be filled in other, you know, against you almost and in a way that is not in your best interest. So it is it's difficult to know exactly what to do. You also have, of course, the problem with the physiological response of having been, you know, moved from zero to 60 on the adrenaline scale and then dumped. Um, so, and this day and age, you know, everything you say is probably not only gonna be used against you, it's probably gonna be recorded. So. So definitely the 911 call <clears throat> is admissible. That, that, oh yeah, that, that's gonna be, that, you're gonna hear that again. Uh, you know, fast forward to a trial, you're gonna hear that. And then anything that you say um, can be used against you and you risk that you either were mistaken about what you said which later could be portrayed as a lie if for example you said there were three and it turned out there were only two or if you said I shot five times but in fact you shot nine you could make an honest mistake in attempting to relay your story that could then sometimes be used to suggest you were lying all along also, um, you risk having perceived things incorrectly or recalling them incorrectly. Um, and you, at that moment, are not going to be remembering everything that you ever knew about criminal law and criminal procedure and all that. Um, so I think the less you say, the better. So understanding uh, that you're going to lose your perception of time um, and then spatial awareness where I was where he was standing and you know that is all because of the adrenaline dump you've just gone through a critical incident uh, things are going off in your brain do I need to defend myself some more am I gonna die I'm not gonna die but what's going to happen next am I safe all your body you know chemistry is just running through there asking a bunch of questions and stimulating responses but then now you have an officer or multiple officers that are just pounding you with questions what do you name? How do you know these guys? Where were you at? Why'd you have a gun? Were you supposed to have a gun? Well, you know, how many shots did you shoot? Just hammering you with that. And, and you have this impending desire to plead your innocence because again, I don't perceive that I really did anything wrong. I thought I was going to die type stuff. Right. And, and there tends to be this dialogue within the shooting community that says, um, you will only say X and you will only do Y until Z happens. Right. And, and what I hear you saying is, well, that's all contextual. It, it's all dependent upon your situation. Yes. I, again, every situation is going to be different, but you risk that. I, I think people need to appreciate that it is not without risk that you say nothing. Um, you know, if you say nothing, you risk that the investigating authorities start to suspect or think or theorize that perhaps you are hiding something. That's just human nature. If you confront your child about how this window got broken and they have nothing to say, 
you're not just going to say, oh, well, they must have had nothing to do with it, right? It's just human nature to suspect that silence under those circumstances implies some degree of a guilty conscience. Also, if you, if you refuse to participate in the creation of the narrative at the beginning, the narrative gets written anyway. And your silence in creating that narrative leaves more space to be filled in, if you will. So there is, I don't want to tell people that the right thing to do is to say everything. That's probably not a good idea either. But I do think people need to appreciate that there is a risk in saying there's a piece of evidence and I want to talk to my lawyer before I give a statement or I, I don't want to say anything. Um, you're, you're probably not going to be able to say anything at the scene that changes whether you're arrested. You're probably not going to be able to say anything at the scene that changes uh, much of anything for the better in all and, likelihood. And let's just clarify real quick. Arrested is different than convicted. Sure. The process would be you're going to be arrested and booked probably. I mean, unless it is just the most obvious justified shooting in the history of man, which, you know, that happens, I guess. But more likely, you're going to be dispossessed of your weapon, cuffed, booked, and hopefully a bond set that you can post and, and be released pending whatever happens next. And then the legal process begins, which will take a long time, honestly. You can never unspeak your words to the police. You can never take them back. You know, uh, where I live, m most or all of the police cars have cameras and audio recorders in the cabin of the car. So even casual conversation with the police officer in the car can be used to show something. You know, I've had cases where my clients said nothing about the event for which they were arrested, but carried on a casual conversation, which, you know, the district attorney later used to suggest, you know, demonstrated some lack of remorse or the clear headedness, you know, uh, that the defendant had, you know, they were clearly aware of what was going on and they didn't react in a way that seemed natural under the circumstances. So. There is no always right answer here. I, my point in this is simply to say, best bet, safest thing to do for the long term is probably to say less, if anything. But there, there is a risk in that course of conduct too, and that is that everyone else there will be talking, and you may be the only person who can fill in certain important facts that would demonstrate the justification and if you are silent at that point, once the, once the initial theory of the event is formulated, it can be difficult to unwind that or to walk it back. So that police officer who writes out that report or sits in his, ca you know, in his cruiser and types out that report at the scene, he's probably not going to come away from that. You know? I mean, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I've never seen one of them go look at their report 12 months later and say, yeah, all that was wrong. They're gonna, they're pretty much committed to that. You know, they right. sign it. You're right. So, if you didn't get involved in the creation of that because you invoked your right to remain silent and to have a lawyer, that may have been the greatest thing to do if you're going to go to trial. But it may have been a missed opportunity to prevent a trial. But you'll never know that. You'll never know for sure whether or not you did the right thing. I think on balance, it is better to say less or maybe nothing as long as you appreciate the risk that you're taking by doing that. All right, so a hypothetical, and I've played this out in my head, so I'm sure a lot of other people have. Uh, on the scene of a clearly identifiable self-defense shooting, the cops roll up, they take your gun away from you, and the first question is, did you shoot him? Well, I I don't think it does you any good to remain silent when 12 people and two cameras are going to show that you did. Um, but if you say you did, then you're never going to get away from that. You know, it's, you can't know at the moment what the defense strategy is going to need to be at a trial that's going to be 12 months from now. You know, I've had cases where something that seemed obvious at the crime scene later became something that state had difficulty proving. So in essence, if, if I, if in that case, if I, if I didn't say, yes, I did shoot him, I said, I had to defend myself. Something along the lines of that. 
it's still a response, but yet it's not an incriminating or yes, definitively black and white. Here he is reading it back to me. He said, yes, I shot him. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a lawyer and you know, I haven't been in this situation. So I'm curious. I would rather, def I would, as the lawyer going to the trial, I would rather have fewer of my client's words read back to the jury by the investigating officer, generally. But that's if you're going to trial. The, the, the fork in the road is your- How am I gonna know if I'm going to trial? I, but you I don't, don't. That's, that's the problem, is that the fork in the road is your candid, truthful explanation offered in a timely fashion may be the reason you don't go to trial. It may be the reason that the district attorney decides not to prosecute the case. It may be the reason that the grand jury elects not to indict you. But if you say all those things, if you say the truth as you know it, and then you are indicted and you do go to trial, you'll wish maybe you hadn't said those things. So it's one of those situations where you can't know if you did the right thing for sure because you'll never get to test both options. You, you have to make that decision. So there's no split testing. There's no way to know, well, what if I say this, will I get indicted? Will I go to jail? Will I go to trial? Well, okay, then I'm not gonna say that. You, you, you have to make that decision at the time. The best case result is you tell the truth and the authorities realize that you were in fact justified in doing what you did and you do not go to trial. But you can't guarantee that because- you have wit <coughs> witnesses. Witnesses and, for you. witnesses and forensic evidence that will corroborate your story and demonstrate the justification that was present in this situation. The problem is humans, there are other humans who do not know you, they do not owe you anything, and maybe they have their own motivation. Maybe you have, you know, uh, uh, an enthusiastic officer who, you know, wants to solve a crime or be involved in a, you know, a gotcha moment. Maybe you have a prosecutor who's ambitious and trying to run for his boss's job or keep his job as an elected official. You just can't know all those things. And so it's not always obvious what you should do. It may be that explaining yourself, being truthful and being candid and reacting in a, in a way that appears to be a natural reaction to having just been involved in something like that is, creates credibility for you. And, and people would watch the video of your interview and say, that guy was clearly, clearly upset and distraught by what had just happened. He's not some stone cold, you know, murderer who just said, I wanna to talk to my lawyer. You just, you just can't know that in advance. And I think that it is too simplistic to say there is always a right course of conduct here. Now, all that said, the truth of the matter is, you will rarely regret having said too little. And I, as a defense lawyer, I would rather not have to try to explain away my client's words uttered under the most stress they've ever experienced in a dialogue that may have actually been choreographed and maybe even a little bit manipulated by the interrogation. You know, I mean, the person doing the interrogation presumably is skilled in that. Right, have been trained. They've been, they've been taught how to do that. So you get these videos, and I've seen them many times, you get these videos and they are produced, directed, and narrated by the officer. And the other person in the video, the defendant, is along for the ride. And that thing, that train's going where that interrogation is, is going to go. So it's a tough call to know what to do. Um, if you do say anything, it should be measured and careful and above all truthful. Because if you lose credibility over one thing, you lose credibility over all. Right. Now, in our in some of our live training courses, we'll do the force on force, and in those force on force, you know, they it somewhat simulated in that they do feel the adrenaline rush, depending on how much they want to believe that what's happening is real, and then their actions and second guess and stuff. So, here's the thing: I will tell our students, you need to make the action such that you can live with that decision to act for the rest of your life, regardless of whether you're free in your house or in jail. You need to live, be able to live with that decision. Yeah, I think that's the right decision. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, you, you, when you make the decision what to do, be prepared to live with it. And if you make the decision to talk about what you did, 
then you have to be prepared to live with that as well, for better or for worse.